couldn't wait any longer, and it was really all for the best because I think this opportunity with First Union Bank and Felix is going to put me in victory lane for the first time. Jimmy Fenning left the 12 car earlier this week. This weekend, he's been spending a lot of time around the 6 car. He will take over as crew chief of the Valvoline Ford next week in Phoenix. Steve Meal will become general manager of Jack Roush's Liberty, North Carolina operation for the rest of this season. But if it extends to next year, it's anyone's guess. Steve Meal is still the crew chief for the 6 car tomorrow, but we'll have a press release for at Phoenix. Uh, Jimmy is going to join us, and I've got every reason to believe by the time we get to Phoenix, uh, Jimmy will be the crew chief. Uh, Steve will be very much involved with the program. Uh, he's going to help be in a position to help Ted and his program a little more and to help lead uh, all three of my teams in the uh, R&D area and to help us get uh, the absolute most out of our body from an aero point of view and, and out of the chassis from a stiffness and a a chassis function point of view, but Steve will be uh, be, be uh, a, a big factor in Mark's car, and Jimmy Finney is going to come and help. The interstate battery Chevy is hoping to be recharged next season as a Pontiac. Joe Gibbs and Bobby Labonte decided to make the switch in an attempt to improve the team's performance next year. Everybody here says the same thing about uh, all the guys in the shop, and Jimmy and Joe said, hey, let's... Uh, you know, let's give it a try and see what we can do. And I think it's the right, right decision, right move, because it's a, it's a fantastic race, race car and uh, great people to work with. And, you know, we're looking forward to it. And it's, uh, it's all in the GM camp, and it's all under MTG's roof. So, uh, you know, we're just kind of switched over. And uh, but I think we're going to have really good success with it. I look at it as, hey, I'm going to enjoy working with all the other Pontiac. Uh, so those guys are some of my buddies, and uh, Richard and Bill and a lot of those guys I've had dealings with, and uh, we're excited about going there and being partners with them. But I think more than anything, it's just a long process, and we felt like for a number of reasons, finally we test the car, we build a car. I liked the way the car drove, and and, uh, and and Jimmy and Bobby got sold on it, and we said, hey, let's do it. In the Unical 76 Pit Crew Championship yesterday, the Kellogg Chevy crew members topped their teammates, the Rainbow Warriors, to take home the title. Terry Labonte's five car led the Hendrick 1-2 punch with a time of 22.05 seconds, almost a second and a half better than the 24. You can see the Pit Crew Championships right here on TNN next month. Another programming note coming up this Tuesday, catch Jeff Gordon wide open. It's a behind-the-scenes look at the reigning Winston Cup champion. Gordon will start third this afternoon here at The Rock. Dale Jarrett, who trails Gordon by 92 points, will start from the pole. Jarrett set a new AC Delco 400 qualifying record of 157.194 miles an hour. Here's a look at the first five rows. Jared and Ricky Rudd, followed by Gordon and Mark Martin. Row three is Bobby Labonte and John Andretti. Robbie Gordon, in just his second Winston Cup race this season, will start seventh. Next to him is Penny Wallace. And row five, it's Ted Musgrave and Todd Bodine. Stephanie, back to you. Thanks, Marlo. There's already been a lot of action at the North Carolina Motor Speedway this weekend. Besides yesterday's pit crew competition, the Bush Series went at it for 200 miles on Saturday, with the points battle in that one getting hotter than ever. It only took till lap two for caution to fly in the AC Delco 200. It happened when this freight train had to put on the brakes, collecting several cars, including Hermie Sadler, Mike Wallace, Ron Barfield, and Jeff Purvis. The only other yellow flew on lap 111 when pole sitter Buckshot Jones hit the wall hard in turn two. He was taken to a local hospital where he was treated and released. Other than that, it was all green flag racing, with Mark Martin's Winn-Dixie Ford by far the dominant car. Dale Jarrett tried to give him a run for his money in the end, but Martin was able to get back by and take his sixth Bush Series win this season. Meanwhile, points leaders Randy LaJoy and David Green both had good days, running in the top ten and dicing it up for the fans. Green finished fifth, while LaJoy wound up ninth. That cut LaJoy's lead in the title chase to just 33 heading into the season finale at Homestead in two weeks, where he can clinch the title with a finish of sixth or better. I'd rather be ahead than, than chasing. Uh, we've chased all year, and uh, let him chase us. As long as I keep that 95 car in, in my sights, we're even going to Miami. We're even here. He just uh, he outrun us by four spots. That's okay. I mean, we had a good day. I looked at him a little bit when he was in front of me, but when he was behind me, you know, I wasn't worried because my car was good and I knew I was up front. And 
And uh, but you know, when he gets up in front of me there, you know, he's he's kind of my goal that I shoot for, and and I think he will say the same about me. But uh, you know, it was a great race. I got up there. He didn't cut me no slack, but yet he gave me some room, and uh, we put on the usual battle like we always do. And that's that's what's neat about it. You know, him and I. You know, whoever wins or loses this deal, we've uh, ran great all year and ran up front all year and did some great racing without wrecking one another, and that's the way it's going to end up. Well, that's all the time we have for this segment of Inside NASCAR. But when we come back, Ned will join you from the shops of the new Skittles race team. Of course, flag-to-flag -flag coverage of the AC Delco 400 gets underway at 1230 Eastern here on TNN. And as we leave you for this break, here's a look at the remainder of the starting lineup. Mooresville, North Carolina at MB Motorsports, a brand new team in NASCAR Winston Cup racing for 1997. They'll race Pontiacs and Skittles will be the sponsor. Derek Cope will be the driver. Derek currently drives for the Bobby Allison Motorsports team, but will switch over here for 1997 and we talked to him about his move. In only his 70th career Winston Cup start, relative newcomer Derek Cope surprised the racing world by winning the most prestigious of all stock car races, the 1990 installment of the Daytona 500. Later that year, he proved to the naysayers it was no fluke, scoring another victory at Dover, Delaware. But in the years that followed, the critics gained some ammunition when Cope's promising career never seemed to take off. Then he joined Bobby Allison Motorsports late in 1994, and the potential that had shown itself early finally started to nurture and grow. In 1995, Coke finished a career-best 15th in the Winston Cup point standings, and although the stats don't show it, this year he's qualified well and had some great runs going before something would spoil his finishes. So when the announcement came at Charlotte two weeks ago that Cope was leaving next year to drive the new and much talked about Skittles car with connections to Rick Hendrick, he says the move wasn't as easy as you'd think. I've had mixed emotions, yeah. I mean, it's a difficult decision, you know, on a lot of those things because you build the relationships. You know, I've talked about it before. Uh, you, you get involved with people, you know, there's, everybody has different personalities and you get to know people and, and understand them. and. Uh, you know, I, I just had a group of guys over there that really believed in Derek Cope, and uh, that's what I've looked for for all, all, all these years. And um, it was tough to leave that, but I just felt like that um, there was other things behind the scenes, nothing to do with personnel that just was not going to take us to the next level. And I felt like that this was an opportunity that could, and hopefully uh, you know, with Ryan and myself and Jay working hard, uh, we'll put that right next to people behind us, and uh, we'll still have that same, same, same kind of collaboration, and it'll happen. The Ryan Cope talks about is former Larry Pearson crew chief Ryan Pemberton, who is moving up from the Bush Grand National ranks. The team will field Pontiacs with motors built by Hendrick Motorsports through Rick Hendrick's close friendship with majority team owner Nelson Bowers. Cope drove Hendrick Motors early in his career, including to his two wins back in 1990. And he says he's looking forward to being reassociated with one of the most stout organizations in all of Winston Cup racing. I feel like that uh, the personnel they have over there is unmatched and the resources that they have. And obviously, you know, I, I've been affiliated with Rick before with uh, the Pure Layer team when we had their motors and ran exceptionally well there and won a race. And, uh, you know, you get away from that and you realize uh, how good it was. And, uh, when this opportunity came up uh, to have our operation with the Skittles Pontiac aligned with Rick Hendrick again and having the motors uh, and that knowledge and, and resource again, um, I think it's a real enhancement to the overall picture of things. 
While Pope says he appreciates the success he had early in his career, those days are gone, and he constantly works at staying focused and motivated on the challenges of the present. Recently, I mean, I've had guys come up to me and say, well, you know, we want to talk to you about uh, Daytona. I say, I don't want to talk about Daytona, so this interview's over. Because it's in the past, uh, yeah, it's great, it's something that happened, and I, I feel fortunate to have, to have lived that. But uh, it's something that I don't dwell on, and I don't try to, to you know, to keep uh, with me all the time. It's something that's way back there, and uh, I want to move on. And, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm 50 and I'm quit, then, yeah, I'll look back and I'll reflect more on it. But, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to hear about how Dale blew a tire and I won the race or this and that. I want to talk about the Skittles Pontiac. I want to go race the race. Uh, I want to talk about this weekend at Rockingham. I want to go out and win races. I want to run productively, and uh, that's what I want to talk about. While Cope is willing to talk about the future, one thing he doesn't like to do is to lock himself in to setting goals. Well, uh, I've been There's no magic in this sport. Uh, you put the best race car you can together, uh, you people pull in one, one direction, you go out there and uh, you, you have to take it as it comes. It's a very instinctive sport. You can't plan anything and I think that you go out there and if you're prepared, uh, then you know the preparation meets the opportunity and you know, hopefully you can see that opportunity. And that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to prepare ourselves, come out as productively as we can. Uh, and I've been there and I know what decisions I need to make. I know when I need to race and when I don't need to race. And I've, stay, I've kind of raced within myself and my equipment here uh, the last few years and I've learned a great deal. So uh, hopefully I'll make those right conscious choices uh, next year and uh, it'll all happen for us and we won't have to set goals. And you know, I mean, we'll just have to wait and see how it, you know, how it, how it unfolds really. I think that I'm still, I'm still young enough to, uh, you know, to have a lot of years left in racing and uh, still I feel like that I've got the experience there uh, to back that. Uh, I've gone through some tough times before. Uh, as of late, I feel like that uh, we've ran very well, we've showcased uh, our potential very well. Uh, just maybe having the finishes aren't really indicative of how good I've really, I've really ran this year. So I'm not really looking at that, but I think that I think right now, I think I'm in a really good position. I think I, I have the confidence uh, in myself, uh, I have comfort level with the team and the people I have, and we obviously have the resources, and I think we're in a good position to go out and run very well next year and, uh, and prove to a lot of people that uh, we can be a mainstream sport. I have a feeling that this sponsor, Skittles, is going to be a popular one around the NASCAR Winston Cup garage area next year. Well, there's a lady that's pretty popular around the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, and that's Kim Irvin. She's the wife of driver Ernie Irvin, and Kim is into horses. When she's not at the racetrack with her husband Ernie, Kim Irvin can often be found atop one of her 11 Pasifino horses at El Cardinal, the farm the Irvins own near Mooresville, North Carolina. Initially, Kim says the horses were sort of a payback since her husband couldn't leave racing alone. It actually come about because he was racing the bush car. And I was like, you know, this Sunday racing pays the bills, but this Saturday racing is a hobby. I'm like, I'm going to get me a hobby. So we went out looking for me some horses, and I started off with two. And I have 11 right now, but, you know, we have, the mares have babies, and then we, you know, trying to sell them and different stuff like that, so. It's, now, you take this seriously, yeah, don't you? Yeah, I really do. I mean, at first it was just a real nice hobby. Now I've, like, tried to build credibility with it, and I show them. Um, this year at the Nationals, um, placed the third and the fifth, which is the first mm -hmm. year we've ever placed at the Nationals. And it takes a while to build your credibility up in any breed. And it's, and it's, I've, I've taken it pretty seriously. I try to be up here about every day that I'm at home. And um, I'm trying, I've bought, like, you know, tried to investigate the bloodlines and stuff and buy some nice mares and breed them. And, I want to raise them, show them, and sell them. And I, like I told Ernie, yes, it's a hobby, but I'd like for it. I know it won't pay the bills, but to at least um, start making a credibility with the farm and selling them and um, being known as a, one of the top breeders in the breed. Mm. I named him Bengtio for 28. Oh. <laughs> He's beautiful. He is. Kim says the horses also help her keep her mind off of things, and that's certainly understandable after all she's been through. Ernie's near-fatal practice crash at Michigan in 1994 also brought reality crashing down on Kim in an instant, something she wasn't the least bit prepared for. When things started out with you and Ernie, especially let's talk about before he had his accident, how did you approach going to the races? I mean, were you nervous at that time? Not really. I mean, to a certain extent, yes. But I guess it's like, I don't know, I guess like 
ignorant of the fact of what can really happen out there and because it doesn't happen to you you have that syndrome or of oh it it might happen to everybody else but it won't happen to me you know so i guess you're safeguarded by that ignorance i guess you call it or something or, or just the lack of knowing that the real dangers of it being out there I, I was nervous to a certain extent, but nothing, you know. I could sit and watch it and not, you know. A lot of other wives and stuff, I watched them, they'd get so nervous, and I would be like, oh, calm down, you know. But I'm one of those now. And with good reason. Just two weeks ago at Charlotte, Ernie had another frightening accident. And while this time, fortunately, he was okay, it was another reminder of the past that still haunts his wife. The, the wreck at Charlotte was really, really hard for me to handle because he... he the radio or whatever got knocked loose and he wasn't answering, you know. And of course that right there was like a nightmare going all over again. But as soon as I knew he was all right, he was in there. I mean, it was like it just a big sigh of relief. But it, it's something that a lot of other wives in racing, racing have to go through. But for me, it's it's like too much like deja vu, you know. And it, it's, it's really hard to handle. But as soon as I knew he was all right, I mean, I was... Thank God I knew we took care of him again and everything like that. So, and if, I don't think God would let him back in a race car if he wasn't capable of it. You know, let him get to this point and do, there's a plan. Like, when he had his accident in Michigan, the doctors gave him a 10% chance to live through the night. And in my, to me, there's a reason why he's still here, you know. And it's just a big plan and we don't know what it is, you know. But I just live, I guess that's it, blind faith. How did that accident change your life in the long run? Well, you never take tomorrow for granted, you know. Uh, you never take anything for granted, you know. Um, every time he straps himself into a car now, I live with a bigger fear than I've ever had before, you know, and it, just practice or anything. Um, we both, I think, take everything, especially our families and our health, we don't take it for granted. And I think, normally speaking, people do. You know, I did. You know, you think you, your health is good. You, you know, that's fine. You're normal. You're used to it. But now I don't, I don't take anything like that for granted, you know. And then it makes me more aware of other people, you know, like when you go, kids that have problems and stuff like that, you're just aware about how lucky certain people are and you're how, how lucky you are when you have good health and you have a good family. And it made you more aware of the little things in life instead of, like now, some of the little problems, well, would have been big then, you know. Now I'm like, if I can handle what I handle, that's nothing, you know. Don't even worry about it. And I guess he's even, Ernie's even more so since he actually taught me that because I still worry a lot about different things. But if you can't change it, don't worry about it, you know. And that's easy for him to say, but at least now I pick bigger things to worry about. It took one of the toughest experiences of her life to lead Kim to those realizations. And next week she'll tell us how she made it through. It was race number 27 of the 1989 season and the Winston Cup points battle headed to Rockingham with Rusty Wallace holding a slim lead over Dale Earnhardt. In a race that was dotted with a track record 14 caution flags for 69 laps, this one was a battle of survival. Throughout the race, Earnhardt and Wallace would swap the top spot, but it was Earnhardt who fell two laps behind late in the race when he and Wallace knocked fenders with 72 laps to go. Earnhardt for the third race in a row would end up eight laps down and settle for 20th. That left Wallace and Harry Gant trying to chase down Mark Martin late in the race. Blaming the late day sun getting in his eyes, Alan Kowicki took Gant out of contention and Wallace couldn't catch Martin as the Jack Roush driver was not to be denied his first Winston Cup victory. Coming up next, Mark Martin was the first driver to test on the new mile and a half Texas International Speedway. He did it this week. We'll have a story on it and we'll have the mailbox and much more, so you stay with us. It's just, it's as smooth as silk. It's a, probably the smoothest racetrack I've ever driven on. Um, and uh, it's going to be one nice facility. Uh, going 
going into Rockham, Randy and uh, David both run good there. And uh, Homestead, you know, that's another place where they, they both run good on flat tracks all year. So I, I think you can uh, probably take a coin and flip it to figure out who. Uh, it's just going to be a tough one to figure. I think it's going to come down to circumstances and who has the best luck the last three races. But uh, I, I really can't pick who's going to win. I think both teams are very outstanding, and, and both of them would be great champions. I really think that uh, uh, Jan Borg's got a good chance at it, or Palmer, Earl Palmer. He's, he's really close. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I think if he doesn't get in there, it'll probably end up being, um, I don't know, probably that Jordan guy. Crew Chief Ryan Pemberton and his crew are busy building new race cars for the Skittles team in 1997. And this is the car they're getting ready for the Daytona 500. And they look forward to testing this Pontiac in January of next year. Talk about testing. The first car to ever test on the new Texas International Speedway was Mark Martin in the Valvoline Ford this week, testing tires for Goodyear, and our Marlow Klain was there. in town. Mark Martin was the lone wrangler this week on the Lone Star State's newest track. He was there to find out if there was room enough here for his gang next April when they try and corral the Texas International Raceway in the inaugural Texas 500. Looking to see how clean it is. You know, when I first start running, how slick it's to expect it to be, you know. It's very clean. It's got dust down into the pores, it, it's slick as hell. Longhorns on his steer, Martin was the first Winston Cup driver to officially lasso TIR in a two-day Goodyear tire test. I don't get excited real easy, but this uh, is truly spectacular. We came in, uh, flew in here last night before dark, and when I saw uh, this place, you know, I had a tingle go down my back. Uh, it's this is big, this is big time. That's just real important for us as, as a team, and, and I'm sure for Valvoline to be the first guys in the gate, first guys run around a racetrack. I know it's something that Mark and myself and all the guys will think about for a long time. We've been waiting a long time to hear the sound of racing motors. Um, it, it's really a, a dramatic thing for us, at least it is for me, uh, because to have seen it come from dirt and up out of the ground and, and you know, we've been looking at this facility for a while, and it, and it really hasn't changed a lot in the last couple of months, uh, but the finishing touches are being put on it, and uh, and now that there's a race car here, um, it, it just, it, it, it's kind of an, an end, a, a completion, uh, our coming out party. The Valvoline Ford Thunderbird ran approximately 70 laps around the speedway, it topped out at 176.355 miles an hour. You know, there's a lot of dirt and dust and concrete dust and, you know, there's no grass here to hold the, you know, and the, and the, the groove doesn't really have uh, much rubber in it. We're about a second off of the Charlotte lap times. Well, this racetrack is an awful lot like Charlotte. Uh, one noticeable exception is the front straightaway is longer. In other words, the corner coming up to the trioval off of four and the corner going off the trioval into one is further down the straightaway, further from the start-finish line. So you're actually turning the car without the benefit of the banking. So it's a more abrupt turn, and the car's not settled down in the banking yet. So based on that, the rear end tries to get out from under it. So that, that'll be a little bit of a sore spot, but everybody will get it figured out. We'll be on an even keel when we get here racing. This track will continue to be compared to its sister track in Charlotte. But one thing that is different is the dual banking in Texas. It's so the stock cars can run on the bank track and the Indy cars can run lower on the flatter ring. Martin and Neil say it wasn't that noticeable. You don't notice it really at all because it just, uh, you know, that appears to be the apron and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the lower banking part of it. And uh, I just... Uh, I think it's great. I, these guys have really, really tried hard to do everything right here, and uh, so far I can't uh, find anything to, to criticize them on. Well, you can walk around and see it, but I don't think we'll ever get down there to use it. Now, I'm not a race car driver, and these guys might decide that's where they need to run, but 
Usually, a place like this, you're looking for grip, and you're happy for the car to settle into the bank, and the more banking you can get, the better. So I'm sure they'll run off the bottom of the racetrack. Mark Martin, or for that matter, any other driver, will not have the distinction of being the very first to find the wall here at TIR. Actually, developer Ross Perot Jr. was out here last weekend, and he holds that distinction of being the very first to hit right here between three and four. Well, the track is great, and uh, I had a great time driving on it, and I just look forward to doing it again if they'll let me. So I got to be real nice to Eddie and Bruton. Let me, let me back out on the track. My advice to him is to not take this too hard. You know, uh, um, I guarantee you I've done a lot of things worse than that in my career. Maybe those were not the highlights of his career, but being the first on this track, Martin says, certainly ranks up there. Well, thanks, Marlo. That's going to be an exciting place to go to when they hold their first NASCAR Winston Cup race on April the 6th, 1997. Still to come, the mailbox and much more. And as we leave you for this break, here's an exclusive offer for Inside NASCAR fans. The Inside NASCAR mailbox is brought to you by Miller. Our question is from Richard Owens from Holland Patton, New York. What is the reason for the split in the center of the rear deck spoilers? Richard, to answer your question about the split in the rear spoiler is, there's two reasons. One, there's a template that runs down the back of the car to do the rear bumper that goes up onto the deck lid. And the second reason for the overall template that runs all the way across the race car. NASCAR also requires us to take a piece of duct tape and cover this split before the car goes on the racetrack. Thank you for your question. If you have any race questions, write to us at Inside NASCAR, Post Office Box 240-417, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224. If we use your question on the air, you'll receive this embroidered Miller jacket, and you'll also receive the Winston Cup scene CD-ROM with all the drivers, tracks, stats, and video finishes from all the races. For CD-ROM orders only, call 1-800-380-7404. We'll be right back with Claire B. Lane. She'll have a story on the news and gossip from Charlotte a week or so ago, so don't you miss it. This is what they call a rolling chassis. They'll be putting a Pontiac body on it and getting it ready to race in 1997 here at MB Motorsports. There was a lot that went on at the Charlotte Motor Speedway week before last when the Winston Cup drivers were there, and Clara B. Lane covers it in the Winston Cup Illustrated Insider. There's a new friendly intra-team competition starting among NASCAR Winston Cup mechanics and crew chiefs. Guys like Chocolate Myers, Brad Parrott, Jeff Hammond, and Joey Knuckles took to the Charlotte Motor Speedway for the first annual Alan Kowicki Memorial Winston Cup mechanics race, which was won by Rick Byers, the mechanic and rear tire changer for the Goodwrench team. Our own inside NASCAR cameraman Richard Campbell went behind the wheel to drive for Jeff Bodine. Bodine was the chief steward and flagger for the event, which was a grass burner. I, I, I was hard to flag because I was laughing so hard, but, you know, they're all mechanics, or most of them mechanics, work on teams, cars, and that's where they need to stay, not behind the steering wheel, believe me. Imagine wanting to spend your wedding night in the infield with thousands of rowdy race fans. Lynn Merritt and Scott Proker wanted to spend their first night together as husband and wife at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. A wedding gift from fellow race fans Tom and Kathy Palatin. Yep, Lynn and Scott's reception was on a bus called Split Decision, and their wedding night accommodations were a plush nuptial uh, tent. It was their idea. <laughs> it was their idea. We did the best wanted, we could. Yeah, y'all did wonderful. They ought to have better sense come down here on their honeymoon, but... This is where it's at. Uh -huh. <laughs> Earl Barbin, one of the best transport drivers on the Winston Cup circuit and gas man for the Miller team, was driving the Miller rig from the cruise hotel in pouring rain the other night when he took a wrong turn and went under a bridge that was unmarked and too low for clearance. The incident tore the observation deck and the top off the Miller transport, making it a Miller pop top. Barbin managed to get the rig to the track, but the top had to be completely replaced. The guys at the shop say that 32-year-old Barbin, one of Winston Cup's most eligible bachelors, has now decided it's time to settle down and find a wife. 
So women, when you see that Miller rig on the road, give Barbin a wave or write Barbin at Penske Racing South, 136 Knob Hill Road, Mooresville, North Carolina, 28115. You know it has to be difficult to race a car around the track at 200 miles an hour and then drive home from the track at a normal speed limit. The drivers tell me that for them it's difficult to keep from speeding off the track. Jeremy Mayfield said he was coming back from the Michigan track in a rental car when he passed through a small town where the speed limit dropped to 35 miles an hour. When stopped by the local law for going 50 and a 35, Mayfield told the officer that he just came from the race and that he drove for Cale Yarborough Motorsports. Mayfield said he knew he was in trouble when the officer said, Cale who? This may look like the stage at the Miss America pageant. It's not. It's the Winston Cup Racing Wives Auxiliary Annual Fashion Show Fundraiser. MCs for the event were Linda Petty and Benny Parsons. Brooke Gordon and Mary Everham participated, as did the families of most of the Winston Cup drivers. Here's Bill Elliott's family, son Chase, rode onto the stage in a wagon familiar to Bill. This wagon, this little red wagon, was Bill Elliott's when he was this age. <laughs> so that was Bill's first ride. Well, I'll be out and about in the race circuit, so you stay tuned. For Illustrated Insider, I'm Claire V. Lang. If you have ideas for the Illustrated Insider, you can email Claire V. Lang at insiderscbl at aol.com. Or if you'd like to read more, you can find Claire's monthly column in Winston Cup Illustrated. Call 1-800-883-7323 to begin your subscription. Hey, I'm Houston Caldwell, and I'm the jackman for Ricky Craven's Bush Grand National Team and carry front tires for the number 41 Kodiak Winston Cup car. Um, one of my duties on race morning on, for the Winston Cup team is to set up pit road. And one of, our, one of the things that we do on race morning is we tape up and, and tape up our pit stall um, to give the guys and Ricky plenty of room when we come in for pit stops. One of the first things that we do is um, we lay our jack out with the, with the jack handle extended so we know our jack man has plenty of room. He doesn't get crowded on the left side up against the pit wall. Then we kind of look at who's pitting in front of us and who's pitting behind us and um, we kind of determine if or make a, an evaluation whether or not we're going to be faster than that car. Um, if the car behind us, if we feel like we may be in front of that car pretty much all day, then we may move the tape back a little bit and, and stop Ricky a little short on the, in the pit stall um, to give him more room to get out of the pit stall. Same thing with the car in front of us. If we feel like, um, you know, that that car it may be faster than us and he's going to be sitting in the pit stall, then we may want to move Ricky back a little bit. We put the tape down on, on the, in the middle of the pit stall, um, usually about six or seven feet from the from the next pit stall ahead of us. Um, that really depends on the racetrack we're at and the size of the pit stall. Here at Charlotte, um, pit stall is, is pretty big and we have plenty of, plenty of room. Um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we, when we set the tape and, and where Ricky's gonna stop is we have to keep the right front tire in the pit stall or that's a NASCAR penalty. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come, a story on Japanese journalists as we leave you for this break, here's a look at what's coming up next week right here on Inside NASCAR. Kim Urban has seen both the best and worst sides of racing and has somehow managed to make it through. We'll continue our talk with the wife of Ernie Irvin, who has a new outlook on life in general. While four top tens in over 20 years of Winston Cup racing may not sound too impressive, Chuck Bown has only started 69 races heading into the 96th season. We'll sit down with the driver who has tested the big time racing waters and is now preparing to dive into the truck series. When you mention Charlotte and Rusty Wallace in the same breath, one tends to think of high banked Winston Cup racing. But recently, the Miller Ford driver found some of his biggest fans aboard the USS Charlotte Naval Submarine. We'll show you how Rusty and the U.S. Navy have come together to cheer each other on. Those stories and more next week on Inside NASCAR. Many of the NASCAR Winston Cup drivers and teams will make a trip to Japan next month for an exhibition race. And as a result, some of the journalists from Japan have been over here covering some of the NASCAR races so to get accustomed to the drivers and what goes on. And that is the subject of this week's Inside NASCAR Profile. 
On November 23rd, NASCAR will put on its first exhibition race outside of the continental U.S. since 1989. 30 teams will pack up for Nagoya, Japan in a 100-lap race around the two-mile-plus Suzuka Circuit Land Road Course. While Rusty and Dale have already been to the Far East to test, a group of Japanese journalists made the trip to Charlotte a couple of weeks ago for a sneak preview. This time we were invited by Ford of Japan and to see uh, NASCAR racing and because we're going to have that uh, Japanese uh, NASCAR race uh, in next month. We thought that we should bring uh, our journalist, Japanese journalist down to uh, Charlotte and show the real NASCAR since we won't be able to, you won't be able to bring the, uh, the big trailers or the merchandise areas to Japan. It would be a great um, chance to see the real NASCAR here. While the racing fans of the Far East are treated to a Formula One stop at Suzuka each year, 1996 will be the first opportunity to see the big passenger-like Winston Cup cars racing in their homeland, and the fans just aren't too sure what to expect. Uh, people in Japan really don't know anything about NASCAR yet, but uh, I'm very happy to be uh, in this position, seeing many NASCAR racing, and so I want to be uh, introducing more uh, to Japanese journalists first and then they'll, uh, not really educating, but let people know about NASCAR. It's because it's so competitive and I like it very much. The racing fans in Japan will be slighted somewhat from seeing what the journalists saw here in Charlotte, but the sights and sounds from the U.S. will be sure to get plenty of ink prior to November 23rd. They weren't probably expecting this much big event uh, being done. So they're very happy being here and they're very excited. They'll, they think they said that they have so many things that they have to write on the article. They can't, they don't know how many pages it's going to take. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. We hope you enjoyed it. And our thanks to Jay Fry, the manager, and all the folks here at MV Motorsports for allowing us to come into their shops and show you around. Next time we come back here, they'll have this place full of race cars. You join us again here on TNN for more on Inside NASCAR. Today's show has been brought to you by Texaco Haviland Formula 3 Motor Oil. Add more life to your car. Take it to the star. And by Miller Beer. Taste the taste of Miller Beer. The one with the red label. Before you make your holiday wish list, you better get the special edition Simpson catalog. Stuffed with new products, special offers, and values for both racers and fans. Call 1-800-71-RACING to get your copy. The official conversion van of Inside NASCAR is Gladiator by Glovell, America's number one luxury van. Glovell, the way we put it together, sets us apart.